Hi and welcome to part three of this masterclass session with me DC Brakes here on the DBS Institute YouTube channel. In this masterclass production series I'm creating this melodic dance floor drum and bass tune from scratch in Ableton Live building absolutely everything from nothing more than a simple sine wave and free plugins. So far in parts one and two we've looked at sound design principles and workflows for making a full drum and bass beat sub bass, leads, melodic parts and effects. So now it's time to put everything together to actually make the track. So in this part, I'm gonna turn my attention really to workflows that I use for building a track, looking at programming and engineering bass and leads, composing and arranging the track itself, processing the master and group buses, and then finally getting the track up to contemporary loudness levels for modern drum and bass. So let's jump back into live now and write the track. Okay, let's go ahead now and add in some subs. So we've got our rough drums, we've got a rough lead in place, and we've already designed some subs. So I'm gonna come in and just grab this very first sub sound that we made. Um, let's just remind ourselves what that's made up of. It's a pure sine wave at C3, and another one, um, two octaves above. Let's look at how that sounds. So we can see on our F2, we're probably coming down an octave actually for our sub. And something like that. So with, it's, it's struggling to, uh, get it exactly right, but it's effectively uh, an F with an F3 harmonic. And what we're gonna do here is just come into uh, a MIDI clip. We've got it scaled again, and I'm gonna solo the lead and the sub and just add in a layer that's complementary to the chord pattern that we designed earlier. If we select both of these at the same time, we can easily do that. And we know where we're gonna land because the first note uh, we want to land on is F because we're working in F and we know which frequency or which F we're gonna go for because we're gonna want it to be the lowest F that we can get away with. And in this case, that's gonna be uh, most likely an F1, which is down around the 44 uh, Hertz as we just saw. So let's just drag that out. Okay, so let's duplicate that note and we're coming up in pitch for the next chord. Um, so let's um, try that. Even though this looks like it's coming down, because the emphasis of this note is the main chord note for this chord, uh, that's really where we're going. So we're kind of coming from F, um, and we're going to kind of come up two, I guess. Might sound good. Yeah, that works. I'm going to say two, I mean two notes in the F minor scale. So we're coming from an F up to an A flat. And then probably down. Uh, how many? One, two, three, four. Uh, four, four or five notes down in the scale. I think it was four, let's try that. Yeah, that works. Now we could either kind of continue that or we could try a different uh, feel. I think it might be good to kind of come back to the A maybe. Um, and the reason for that just is that if you hang around on the same bass note, sometimes that can be a little bit boring. So we're trying to inject a bit of movement in the bass line without it being kind of all over the place. Um, we're coming up at the end here. So let's just shorten this one down. And actually I just need to make the grid a bit smaller. And the good thing about doing this comparatively in two clips like this is that we can see, for example, this section doesn't start actually at the beginning of that bar. Um, so it's actually gonna be better to kind of have it off like that. Oops, I'm just gonna make that a bit shorter so we're not coming off the end here, like so. Okay, great, so that's basically the rough pattern for our sub bass. Um, we might wanna jazz it up a bit, maybe add in some notes to kind of complement these guys here, maybe something like that. just to kind of complement these sort of uh, in-between notes. Um, but that is a rough pattern. I think uh, it fits the lead and it works quite well. So let's just listen through to that one more time. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is to look at how the sub is going to fit into the track, specifically how it's not going to affect or be affected too much by the kick. Now I'm gonna cheat a little bit at this point because so far I've only been using free plugins, but just so I can demonstrate this most clearly to you, I'm gonna use a pay for plugin now. You don't need it when you're doing this technique, but it does help. 
uh, and it is an excellent plugin if you want to check it out. But it's called uh, Vision. It's by the team at Excise Audio and Noisier. And what I'm going to do is just look at the sub for a moment. You can see our fundamental and that little harmonic that we added in here as well. Now let's chuck in the kick. And you can see that the energy, so where it's brightest orange here, the energy of the kick finishes and clashes with the sub. And you can see what's actually happening here is that it's happening in such a way as it's actually destroying part of our sub base here and it's causing all sorts of problems. So this is only going to get more exacerbated as we try to mix the track later for loudness. So really what we want to do is to try and bump the frequencies of the sub out the way whenever the kick is happening. We can do that a number of different ways, but the most efficient way to do that is to use volume shaping. Now, because apart from Vision, I'm using free plugins, um, we have a, quite a small range of volume shaping plugins that we can use to do this. In fact, I've only really found one that does the job well, and that is a Max for Live device called Duck Buddy. Now, this is actually a really, really good plugin. Uh, you should definitely check this out. The main reason why it's good and uh, is actually useful is because it has a support of a MIDI trigger input. So what I've done is with my kick, I've just chucked the kick into an instance of Simpler and it has no outputs, it just sends only. So we can't hear it, but you can see if I solo it that it is still producing that trigger. So we're gonna route that trigger into kick body here. There it is, kick trigger. And the way that this works then is it's going to apply a volume shape every single time that kick actually triggers and we can change the shape of that. Uh, we can use some presets or we can draw, we can add points by double clicking, we can use shift to uh, remove points and we can use option to create bends and things like that as well. And we can cho choose the length of this grid and the resolution of this grid and also there's some really good controls for kind of look ahead and how smooth it is and the ramp which is a bit, a bit like a, an attack control it's like how quickly the volume control uh, takes uh, effect so all of these things and also the depth as well if you don't want it to completely remove it you can uh, have it just being kind of pushed out the way up to a certain uh, or down to a certain level so for example only taking away up to 18 decibels of gain in that situation um, so let's look at how we can then kind of create an envelope that's going to move our sub out the way whenever our kick uh, fits, uh, hits. So we probably want to go for a length of one bar. We know that our kick is about um, uh, an eighth long. So if I just have a look at my kick here, um, in fact, let's go show uh, in browser. Here's our kick. Let's chuck this onto an audio track. We can see it actually exactly how long that is. So if we if I just duplicate this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you can see that's one bar. So this is roughly from start to finish an eighth note um, long. So that's essentially what we want to do. So in the context of this, that is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. Our grid is actually at nine. We want our grid at eight. Essentially, we want to put a point like that and do something. We don't want it like completely flat. Something like that would probably be around the ballpark of what we're looking for. So if we have that set up on our sub, let's look in vision and see how that's actually affecting our sub base now. So you can see it's very neatly removing eighth note long pauses uh, whenever the kick hits. Let's see with our kick back in how that fits together. Now I'm going to come and deal with these clicks in a moment, so don't worry too much about those at the moment. But as you can see, it's not perfect, and you might be able to hear it's not perfect as well. Um, so where Duck Buddy gets really good is if you hit on this plus button here, you get this huge window, and you can route in different things to be able to have a look at exactly what's going on. So when I hit play now, we can see our sub that we're ducking. You can see the envelope that we've drawn in, and we can also turn on this auxiliary view and choose an input. So let's choose um, our kick here. And voila, our kick appears as if by magic. And so what we can now, now do is fine tune this to a really like good degree to make sure that we're removing as much of the sub as we need to, but only the right amount of sub that we need to in order to kind of keep as much sub in there as possible, but not that it's clash, clashing with the sub, uh, with the kick. So just playing around, I mean, that looks 
pretty good what I've done there. That looks fairly accurate. But, you know, you can play around and experiment with that and try and get it as accurate as you can. But something in that ballpark is actually going to be pretty good, I think. We'll probably have a bit more like that, a bit smoother maybe. But yeah, without spending ages doing it, something in that ballpark is going to be about right. So let's just go ahead now and then render our sub bass into another channel. Oh, we just need to turn our kick off. Oops, so low there, there we go. Appreciate that is really quiet. Let's just go in and turn that up to start with. Okay, so let's have a look at what's going on. So we can see where those clicks are happening because in certain places, and actually because we use the ramping and the, and the smoothing, it's not too bad. But before, some of these sine waves would have been cut off quite aggressively, and that's what would have caused the clicking. Um, what we can see is where these notes, I've added in these extra notes, you can see that it is summing in a weird way, and we're getting these little peaks. If I zoom out, you can see that a bit more clearly. So we want to try and level these notes off, and some of these notes are going to be slightly louder than others. They're, they're actually all fairly consistent, but sometimes you'll find that some are higher than, than others. Um, so from a mixing point of view, you might want to try and level those out as well. Let's have a look. If we just solo this and look at it in vision, we can see some of these clicks that are happening. And so really the best way to try and deal these with these, and it is just a fiddly process, is just to come in and cut and fade. And you'll see what that does is it just smooths out the transition from the zero point crossing into the sound. And you need to really kind of do that at the beginning and end of every single bass note in your sequence. So adding in those fiddly little kind of extra notes has actually created a whole bunch more work for me to do. Um, but essentially, if you go ahead and do this, what you'll end up with is a really neat and precise transition between your kicks uh, and your subs, and you won't have any of these pesky clicks either. So let's just actually go ahead and do that for like the first section of this bass line. I'm just gonna work very quickly here just to show you roughly what this involves. Something along these lines. So you can see that one in particular would have been quite a nasty click. Uh, we can see here where we've got the transition between the two bass notes. It might be that I need to go in and just resample that one short bass note to get that completely pure, but I'm just gonna use a fade on that for now to deal with that. Okay, let's just do that uh, first bar there, our first two bars. Okay, let's loop that and um, play that with our kick and see what we're getting. So there's a little bit of a click that we can see there, and you might be able to hear that. So we need to just go and finesse some of those, but otherwise that is sounding um, much better and looking much better as well. So it's quite good to do this visually as well. One other thing that we could do at this point would be to resample both of those things together, and then we could see uh, exactly what's going on between these two elements uh, as they sum together. So let's have a look at this. Let's just make that, there we go. So there's our kick. And as you can see, there's a really nice, neat transition between the end of the kick and the start of the sub bass. And then our sub bass note is ending neatly before the kick starts. And then the same here, the same here. Um, this one's not quite so neat. You can see there's a bit of a funny sort of transition there. That might be where we're getting one of our clicks. Uh, and so you can just go through with a fine tooth comb. This is where that um, sort of the, the issue we had between the sort of the the, uh, the short note was happening. As I said, I could go back and just resample that short note and, and trim that manually to, to kind of fix that. But this is a great way of uh, handling this. And the other great thing about this now doing this is that we can see that the sub notes are much quieter than the kicks. So actually what we need to do is to come in and turn this up. So if I hit resample again, I can do that on the fly. If I wasn't actually recording the automation there, that would have been ideal as well. Um, and I need to gain stage this better so that it's I don't have to keep turning it up each time. But now you can see uh, that the kicks and the sub 
are a bit more balanced. Actually, the sub is a little bit too loud now, um, but you get the idea. So that's a great way to kind of set up the kick and the sub for your track. So the next focus for me at this stage in the track is really to polish up the main 16 barred sort of section at the drop and to kind of give myself some context to work back from. So we've got our intro with some music and some drums and then a kind of a gap where I'm going to put a build up later on and then the drop. So I really just want to kind of get this in some sort of shape so that I can then start you know, figuring out how I'm going to drop into the main idea first. So at this stage, I've just taken all the drums, I've got my sub, which I've tidied up and chopped as we saw in the last video and got to a certain level. And now I want to go ahead and start processing the lead. So I've taken all the processing off of the lead to start with. So it's just a kind of dry sampler instrument as we had uh, at the start, which uh, looks something like this. And I just want to start by focusing on how I can process this to sound as big uh, and as lead-like as possible. So the first thing I really want to do is just try and balance the tone. So I'm going to use an EQ8 for this. And the main reason for this is that it supports mid-side processing. So without going into too much detail, essentially the mid information you can think of almost as the mono information. It has no stereo width. It's right in the center. And the sides, as you might expect, is the uh, purely stereo information minus that mid-channel information. And so to flick between the two, we just click on this button like this. And so at the moment, our lead, it doesn't really have much stereo information. And we want to keep the mid-channel really strong because that's what's going to cut through and give it weight and make sure that it works on numerous different sound systems. Um, but we, do, we can also kind of polish it up to sound a bit bigger as well. Now, in the sides, we don't really want any sub information. So the first thing to do is to probably apply quite a steep uh, cut to the low end just in the side channels and we're only going to have that in the mid channel and I'm also going to boost up the sides in fact not with a um, a bell but rather with a slope something like this and this is just going to create a stereo effect by making the content in the high end louder in the sides compared to the center and then from the mid point of view um, we probably want to add some body to kind of make it really powerful um, in the in, in the mid-channel. So to do that, we're looking at the kind of uh, applying a bell in this kind of 100 to 1K kilohertz range, something like that. And so if we now listen to the lead with and without that processing, you can see what a big difference that can make to actually pull the lead into a more polished shape. So without and then with. Now that can throw off the pan a little bit. It sounds like it's coming a bit too much to the into the left channel now. We can see that here as well. So you can just use the pan controls to rebalance that if need be. Now it sounds quite dry at the moment. So the other things I want to add maybe a little bit of um, delay and reverb. So let's add a little bit of delay. We'll just go for something simple. Um, the Actually, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to rather use a, um, a filter delay so that we can really shape each part of the, uh, the filter. And I'm just going to have it just on both the left and the right at the moment. But what this allows us to do is to kind of shape uh, the, 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 um, the tone of the resulting filters a bit more. And that's quite important with the lead because you don't want it to be too full and the delays to be too distracting. So by removing particularly this kind of low mid area, um, you can really help to do that. So let's just bring the level of this signal down and then just gradually mix it in. And uh, you'll hear what I mean. Uh, we probably want to go for quarter notes. Let's see how that sounds. Increase the feedback so it just lasts a bit longer. Okay, and then let's add some reverb as well. Just go for a standard reverb from there. Um, with the reverb, Again, because we want to maintain the body of the sound, and certainly from a mixing point of view, we don't want the this to kind of dominate everything else in the track. A good thing to do is to have a low cut on the reverb signal so that we're not cluttering up the low end, particularly uh, in terms of keeping the, the, the low end clean for kicks and subs and things like that as well. So 
Uh, similarly, I'm not too worried about the size and things like that at the moment. I'm just trying to get a bit of a character and a flavor for where I want this to go. But essentially, I'm just trying to place it in a space. And because we're going for that kind of euphoric, uplifting feel, I want it to sound pretty big. So I want it to be quite a big sounding reverb. So something like that. So let's put it back in the track and see how the track now pulls together. So if I just group all of that processing together, we can hear what a massive difference that's made uh, to the lead sound in general. Now, something to bear in mind whenever you're adding any FX processing like this, but particularly reverbs and things like that, is that the chances are you're adding in some extra harmonics uh, or distortion or frequencies that you might not necessarily pick up on straight away. And particularly, this is really important um, in consideration of the low end of your signal. So let's just have a quick look at what our lead looks like. You can see there's quite a lot of low end stuff that's kind of appeared. So. A way to handle that would just be to bring in an EQ at the end of your processing chain and just um, making sure that you're removing any of this low content. In fact, we'll be able to see it here in EQ8 as well. And you can see that that's tidied things up. Now, it may only be minus 30, minus 40 dB, but when that's being summed with um, the sub that's going to be there and the kick, things can get really messy and that can help um, kind of mess up your low end and reduce the loudness of your track overall. So it's important to keep an eye on some of these things as well. Uh, just as a final note on that, let's have a look at the difference that makes in vision because this will give us a really, really clear idea of what's going on. And before. So sonically and audibly, it doesn't make that much difference, but it will uh, have quite a big impact potentially when we come to mix the track down. Now, a great way to identify issues like this is to actually start committing things to audio. And from that, we can see um, a bit more clearly than perhaps we might be able to hear what exactly is going on. So I'm just going to resample this first chunk here. And uh, let's see if we can identify some issues in this lead sound that aren't straight as easy to hear when you're working in MIDI, perhaps. Now, I just want to point out as well that the way that the signal routing works for resampling is that it's coming out of our channel into our master and then into our resampling lane. And because of the way that I need to make the audio for this video, I've got the gain down on the master with the utility by minus 12. Our resulting audio is also now down uh, by minus 12. So ignoring the overall level of the gain for a moment, we can see that as the notes get longer and extended with the use of the automated uh, release and decay that we were looking at before, that's making everything louder, which is great. We kind of wanted to add emphasis. But you can see actually that this signal is a bit lopsided. It's actually skewed off to the left. And if we look at this on this side, it's something that we've just looked at. The weighting of the track is a bit to the left still, even though we kind of had a quick bash at um, you know, kind of panning it. But it doesn't necessarily matter in this context. It depends on the mix of the track, but it's just something to be aware of. And it's something that's perhaps a bit more easily identifiable when you're working in audio. So that's really the main takeaway from this. If we wanted to uh fix this kind of gain variation we could look at doing some glue compression that might be something that we could do that's quite a good technique for um sort of managing gain across this type of content and all we're really looking to do is just bring the threshold down until we're getting a couple of db of gain reduction and then add the same amount of makeup gain at the end of the signal so let's have a go at doing that Again, because uh, I had that minus 12 dB of gain, we're having to bring the threshold down quite far. If 
we want a more extreme effect, we can turn up the ratio so that it's um, uh, everything above the threshold is being compressed by a greater amount. And anytime you're doing processing like this, if you're not sure what it's doing, a great thing to do is just to once again resample it down and then compare the two. And that can really help visually give you a clue as to what's going on when you're applying some of these processes if you're not that familiar with doing so. Once again, because it's running through the master, um, we're getting minus 12 dB of gain reduction. So I'm just going to turn that off. So now we can very easily visually compare uh, the two signals. Um, and as you can see, it's pretty subtle stuff, but it has leveled out a little bit. These bit, these ones here are louder than these ones, and these ones have pretty much stayed uh, around the same level uh, overall. So really what we've done is we've just reduced the difference between the quietest parts and the loudest parts of our lead, and that can make it sit better in the mix because it's more balanced and um, the quieter bits aren't gonna be as drowned out perhaps as they might have been had we not applied that compression. So now adding in some of the musical elements and setting a level for the lead and putting everything together, we're now approximating without really having done too much processing, either at kind of the group or bus level or on the master channel. Uh, we've now got a mix that's starting to get in the ballpark of where we need it to be. Let's take a listen. Okay, now I've got the basic components of my track more or less where I want them in terms of the drums, the sub, uh, musical elements, and the lead. I want to return my attention briefly to the master bus and to set up some processing that I can use to get the track more or less in the ballpark of where I want it to be sonically. And I'm talking specifically here about the tone, so using EQ, the stereo image, so using an imaging plugin, and then finally its loudness. So I'm going to be using some free plugins from Native Instruments. There's the Ozone 11 Equalizer, which is a mastering plugin that we'll look at in just a moment. There's also Ozone 8 Imager, which is a stereo imaging plugin, as the uh, name suggests. And then in terms of loudness, I don't want to do any kind of limiting or anything like that. I'm just going to be using my clip chain and the same process that we looked at earlier to get this as loud as possible, uh, as cleanly as possible. And then finally to, I guess, monitor all of that we're going to be using another really good free plugin um, called the Yulian loudness meter uh, 2 uh, which we'll look at again in just a moment but for now we're just going to start by looking at ozone 11. now for a free plugin this has some really advanced features in it not only can we work in stereo mid side left right and also transient sustain modes which isn't necessarily that useful for mastering a drum based track in this context um, but could be great for sound design and also some other mastering applications. We can also take advantage of a gain matching tool, which is similar to what we've seen with our kind of clipping process um, here, which basically just allows us to apply processing to the EQ and uh, automatically compensate for any gain that we're adding or removing so that we can work transparently and not be kind of fooled into thinking that something sounds better or worse just because it's louder uh, or quieter. And finally, it also has this delta mode that allows us to hear the exact processing that we're applying through doing uh, any EQing. So just to kind of give you an example of that, let's take the mid channel here. So we're working in the mid. Let's just whack in a massive bell curve. Again, because this is a mastering plugin, the amount of gain that we can apply is quite limited because in mastering you tend to you know, use sort of smaller, subtler uh, movements. But just to use like 6 dB of gain in the, in the mid mids here, just to make it really obvious, let's just um, add that in so you can hear firstly how that sounds. So without gain matching, um, we can't necessarily objectively tell uh, how much better or worse that sounds because it sounds louder, it might just sound a bit better. So if we turn on gain matching, you'll see that it starts to turn down the uh, output to compensate for anything that we're doing on the input side. So let's just kind of show you how that works.
So as I was moving that through, you could see the gain was uh, adjusting accordingly, and that can help us to work in a in a more transparent and a more balanced way to just work on the tone uh, of the track without um, affecting the overall gain of the track as well. So let's just uh, keep that on now and just review the delta function. So at the moment, as we're doing that, we can kind of bypass it and hear what difference it makes. And again, having the gain match there really helps us to hear exactly what effect is happening without adjusting the gain. But we can also use this delta uh, function. So let's just listen to it uh, in terms of the delta. So that's the difference between the input and the output of the processed uh, audio. And this isn't the same as just soloing it. So when we solo it, we're hearing um, all of the audio processed, but just within the frequency band of the uh, bell curve or whatever shape we're applying. So again, this is a really useful way of being able to tell exactly what difference the EQ processing decisions uh, that we're making are having on the resulting track. So at this stage, all I actually really want to do though is to use mid-side processing to remove any stereo width in the low end. And if I find myself at this point having to kind of apply much processing in terms of EQ other than that, it may indicate to me that there's a problem somewhere else in the track. So rather than trying to fix it here, we can just use it as an indicator that actually we, we need to fix something else. So maybe the sub's like way too loud or maybe the track's far too dull uh, and we can look to go and fix that elsewhere in the project rather than trying to fix it at this stage. So let's just go in and give ourselves a high pass. We can choose the uh, slope of this. We probably don't want it to have be much more than 24 dB, 12 could be enough. And, and actually, because we've already kind of done this process, the chances are that there isn't much content in the sides um, in this area anyway. I'm actually doing this in the mid, so that's uh, wrong. Let's do this in the side channel. And then just while I'm here, actually, in terms of why this is such a powerful plugin, particularly from a mastering point of view, we do have access to quite a few different shapes. So we've got a flat, resonant, and brick wall uh, in terms of EQ. So if you need some brick wall EQ uh, just when you're producing as well, something that um, uh, like EQ8 and Live can't do, you can also uh, bring that in uh, here as well. So that's uh, quite a useful thing to know about. And then also in terms of things like high shelves, we've got lots of different shapes like backs and doll shapes, which can really help to add um, some top end uh, shine on tracks as well. But without getting too much into that at the moment, we're just gonna, as I said, remove some of the low end in the sides of our track. Um, really just from a, uh, a sort of safety point of view, we don't want any sub content in the sides. <laughs> Hey everyone, I hope you've been enjoying this tutorial. At DBS Institute, we provide degree level training to help you take your skills to the next level and start your career in music production. Head to the link to find out more. So we'll leave that there for now and come back to that as and when we look at the mix down of the whole track. Let's look then next at the imager. So we've got this vector scope here, which we can use to see how stereo or mono our track is. Let's take a look. And we can see really most of the content is slap bang in the middle. There's a few little dots around here, which indicate the thing, some of the content is a bit more stereo. And then we've also got this phase correlation meter here, which shows us if there are any phase issues in the track. We're looking for something hopefully close to plus one as this is, but as we get closer and closer down to zero and definitely we don't want to dip below uh, zero, it might indicate that we might have some phase issues going on in the track. And that could sound uh, really bad um, when we come to sum the track to mono, which we'll look at in just a moment. But just once again, then looking at how it is at the moment, you can see it's very mono and near perfect phase correlation. So at this stage, we don't have any issues to worry about. However, we might choose to spread this out a bit to make it sound a bit more, um, a bit fuller in terms of the stereo image. So we can use these bands on uh, the left here. And if we don't necessarily know where the best place to put these is, um, we can use the learn feature and that will just listen to the track, analyze it and set up our bands for us. <laughs> 
and then we can start to shape them. Now, we know that we don't want any width in the stereo uh, in the low end, so we're just going to bring that down to minus 100. Probably doesn't need to do that because there's probably nothing there anyway. But then generally, we can just look to increase the stereo width through uh, the signal, something like this. So let's just see how that kind of compares now. We can see that that is really starting to spread things out. We can hear that as well, hopefully as well. Um, we've also got uh, the polar level and lucid G uh, ways of um, monitoring this as well, which can also give us a, an indication of um, the stereo image in different ways. So this indicates to me that we have possibly some room to make the track a bit more stereo overall, but what we do need to also do is make sure that we're checking from time to time that the um, the track is still mono compatible. So we can sum all the audio to mono. And when we're doing this, what we're not looking to do is to make sure that the stereo and the mono versions sound exactly the same, but just that both individually work acceptably. So if when we want um, sum, sum this to mono, if we had some major phase correlation issues, we might find sort of some notes disappearing or you know sort of levels leaping all out all over the place it might sound a bit weird and that would indicate to us that we have a problem somewhere else uh, in the project um, but if both sound basically okay at this stage that's all we need to really worry about we're not again doing a full mix down at this stage so just listening to the mono mix there obviously it does sound quite different to the stereo one but I can hear everything is quite clear and there's no obvious problems with it. Uh, we might want to improve the mix, but generally it sounds um, problem free at this stage, which is all I'm really worried about. So then let's look at our clip chain and all I'm going to do uh, is very quickly set this up to be um, producing a uh, as loud a signal as I can without distorting. Uh, so once again, just using the input gain here, setting the gain signal to be zero at the start of the chain and then processing it um, to get it as loud as we can. Just worth bearing in mind that because this is going to be a video that's produced for YouTube, uh, the loudness levels are going to be mastered for that. And so uh, in order also not to blast you, I'm going to be adjusting the levels accordingly. But we'll use the Yulian loudness monitor as well so that you can hear uh, exactly how loud the track is or see how loud the track is um, as a result of applying this clipping. So let's just kind of walk through the process and then see how we get on. You can see how much it's being gain reduced. turn this off now um, we're going to be able to see uh, exactly how loud we are I'm just going to have to turn this down uh, so that it's not super loud you can see that me turning down the master doesn't actually affect the uh, the Yulian uh, loudness meter so we can see that at the moment we're at kind of minus 7.4 I could push that a bit further on the clipper but it's going to start to um, sound a bit distorted now again at this stage all I'm looking to do is get this roughly about as loud as it can go without having done a full mix down and we'll look at how we can improve the overall loudness um, in a later video but for now all this is really telling me is that for example the thing that's making this clip most obviously is the lead so I know now that my lead is too loud and so without doing any kind of further processing at the mask level I'm next going to turn my attention to how I can work with the groups in the individual channels within the track to get those to a better level um, so that I can then push things a little bit further at the master to get this track as loud as possible and sounding sonically as good as possible. So we'll leave it there for the master processing. Hopefully you've seen how some of the workflows and some of the considerations that we're going to need to think about for setting this up and we'll turn our attention now to group processing. So now we've got our master roughly set up for how we're going to be using it. We can turn our attention to the individual buses or groups within the project and applying processing to those uh, higher up the chain, as it were. And this is very much what we call a top down approach. So we're starting at the end and then we're working backwards rather than uh, sort of thinking about each individual channel within our project. And this can yield more uh, sort of better results faster. It's something that follows, for example, um, the idea of Pareto's principle where 
80% of the impact of the work that we have comes from 20% uh, of the decisions that we make. So what that means is that uh, we spend uh, most of our time doing things when we're producing um, that have quite negligible results and we get the kind of skeleton or the sort of the main sort of frame, if you like, of our track, that 80% done uh, with just 20% of our decisions. And it's kind of annoying that we spend 80% of our time fiddling around for that kind of final 20%. But nevertheless, this is a good approach for kind of speeding up and getting everything into the ballpark of where we want it quite quickly. So we heard there uh, through kind of um, clipping uh, the track as, as hard as we could, uh, or not super hard, but we could hear that the, the point at where it started to fall apart um, was the, the lead. So we know that the lead is perhaps a bit too loud. Um, but before we kind of start working on the levels of the individual groups, I want to look at some different ways of actually routing these. So at the moment, for example, we've got these the sort of different groups here and we've got groups within groups and this is a way of kind of managing levels and applying processing, which is fine. But one thing we haven't done is to look at creating uh, kind of sub mix channels or, uh, or buses more so than groups. And what I mean by this is that we can take different elements and route these into um, a different track. So I'm going to call this uh, pre-master. And the reason why you might want to do this is to process some of these different channels together uh, and others not. So for example, the sub is something that we want to keep completely clean as much as possible all through the signal processing until we get to the master bus. Um, but we might want to, for example, really like compress, let's say the symbols and really bring those up to add some energy into the track. So what we could do is we could, um, we don't actually need an input in terms of recording. So we just put that onto no input, but we could come into drums. We could find our tops layer here and we could send that to our pre-master here. Um, we might also want to bring in some other elements. In fact, we might send all of the music or parts also to this pre-master. And then in order to be able to monitor those together, we just need to turn this to in so that we can monitor the input. So let's just do that now. So something that we might want to do, for example, would be to compress this, um, make it really loud, and then also um, look to push, perhaps push it out to the side so that we can have the mid channel focused on the energy from the kick, the snare, the sub uh, and the lead. So uh, in order to do that, um, we might choose to apply some multiband dynamics, for example, and really look to uh, compress the um, uh, signal above the threshold. So let's, all I'm going to do is I'm going to use the threshold control to uh, meet the level that's coming in and then use a very high or in fact infinite ratio, pretty much like uh, limiting the signal in fact to um, squeeze it as loud as we can. So now that we've done that, we can, we're getting, a, we've got almost, well, almost known, but very small dynamic range between the loudest and the quietest parts of those uh, channels. So we can now um, look to just boost those up a bit more uh, evenly without the, the kind of level poking around and perhaps um, causing problems at the master level. So if we were to look at this, this would start to look like really flat and kind of undynamic, but that's fine because the other parts of the track are going to be kind of adding uh, that dynamism, like certainly the kick and the snare, for example, uh, and then the melody uh, of the lead is going to kind of be punctuating that, as it were. So let's just listen to how we can kind of uh, really quite aggressively smash this into the master to try and fill out the track and give it a load more energy um, as well. And that's why we've kind of set this up after we've kind of already done some processing at the master level. probably also want to have a really short attack and release time so we can scale that across all the different bands rather than kind of coming in and doing each one individually just with the time control. And the other useful thing about using multiband dynamics is it has this amount uh, band and we can use this for um, kind of dialing in how much of this effect that we actually want. 
but it's important to note that you don't want to necessarily do this with your sub. You want to keep your sub, as I said before, clean all the way through. If you run a sub through this, you're going to get some phase issues almost certainly. So we want to keep this just to kind of the high and the mids. In fact, I might even just turn off um, the low as well. Okay, let's come back to our master and see how we're getting on in terms of overall loudness. And it's the integrated lifts measurement that we're looking at here. Let's see if we can push this a little bit more uh, in the um, clipper. So doing those two things now, I've been able to get the track up to near a minus six, which is absolutely fine in terms of competitive loudness for this genre. You can push it a lot harder and we haven't even yet really done um, a full kind of mix down, but we now have the track set up broadly speaking uh, how we want to do it. And without kind of going into it too much, we could now go through and just kind of EQ some of these individual channels and look at areas where we can kind of find some additional savings. We could also use the clip chain perhaps on the lead, uh, on the music layers, and kind of just get those as loud as possible as well. Okay, so we've been able to squeeze a few dB extra out of uh, those channels now. And so we have to kind of go through this iteratively because now, um, doing the same thing on this channel. It's, it's going to throw in the levels out a bit, but once we've done this, we can go through and, um, you know, ideally we'll review how we've got on with Yulian and probably found that we've gained another couple of dB as well. Now you will find that some content you can really push really hard, like the musical layer doesn't really have any transients, it doesn't really have any sub, so we can clip that really hard. So this will have thrown out the levels quite dramatically, but now, we know that each of these is about as loud as they can go. We can balance the levels between to get um, the best possible output at the master stage. So let's see what we're at now. So doing that, we've been able to squeeze another dB, dB and a half or so uh, out of the track as well. So we know that roughly now at this point, this track is certainly loud enough. Um, we haven't really thought about the mix in terms of EQing and things like that, but very roughly, this is kind of where we want it to be. And now we can go ahead and actually finish the track and write all the rest of it now that we've got everything set up, broadly speaking, how we want it. Okay, so in this video, I'm gonna be looking at some different workflows for how to write a drop and some different approaches you can take. But essentially, we're going to be looking to utilize a lot of the different assets I've already made before that I've saved into my library to speed things up. And this is just a good reminder to do this as you're going along to help you write faster. And essentially, just think about compositionally and arrangement-wise what it is that we're trying to do here. So essentially, we've got our 16-bar intro, which is just kind of beats and some melodic pads, arps, and things like that here. And we've got our fully developed or fairly fully developed idea over here. Uh, we're not too worried about the mix at this stage. We just want to write and compose to get from A uh, to C, if you like, via B. And I've got 32 bars uh, that I give myself uh, to do that. And incidentally, the reason for that is that this um, phrase, if you like, our main phrase is eight bars long, 
and um, kind of loops over 16 as well. It's kind of a main section in drum and bass is usually 16 bars long. And so I want to be able to kind of introduce the idea and sort of change it enough to then kind of reintroduce it here and, and keep things different. 16 bars can be quite short to try and introduce an idea and sort of change it and uh, not be kind of too fast for, for the listener. So let's get, get cracking. And essentially, the first thing I need to do or I want to focus on is introducing the lead sound. So I'm just going to start by copying this over uh, here like so and duplicating it. Uh, but I don't want it just to kind of come in. So I'm going to filter this up with a uh, an auto filter. So a lot of what we're doing here is just thinking about how can I take what I've already got and bring it into the track and introduce it to the listener in a way that kind of makes sense sonically. I'm actually just going to duplicate this so that I can work on this layer and not worry about it affecting what I've already got in the drop um, as well. So actually we can get rid of the auto filter on that one. And essentially what I want to do is just making sure that we can um, see this, just turn on the filter, bring the filter cutoff down and bring it down like that. Perhaps bring it in fully around halfway through our build up. Something like that. Um, now, at the moment, obviously, it sounds really empty. There was a bit of noise in it up here, which I don't think I kind of chopped off in the drums. Was there? Or nothing there? Where is it? Uh, down here. Let's just get rid of that for now. But what I might do is to try and work um, almost sort of like reductively. Uh, I don't know if that's a word, but <laughs> what I mean is kind of start by just chucking everything and then deleting stuff um, that I don't want and to just give myself something to, to work back from. Okay, so there's like far too much going on. Let's get rid of some of this stuff here. Um, in fact, let's just get rid of all of that kind of hi-hat and sort of crash noise. What else have we got? We've got some musical elements here. I mean, the musical elements, let's just listen to those. Got that kind of cool noise effects there. We've got all these different risers here. Maybe this sort of more musical stuff down here could also be brought up uh, in a similar way. So yeah, let's chuck an auto filter on here. And again, automate this. Um, in fact, we could just tap here, it's a bit quicker. So that's where it was, or it, let's have this all the way open. And then might help to zoom in a bit, it's a bit fiddly sometimes this. Probably don't want it all the way down. Maybe starting around there. And then we need this to be all the way open by the time we get uh, to the drop here. Let's hear how that sounds. Also got these bell pl plucks uh, that are not in that group. So let's do something with those. Uh, maybe also another auto filter. It's kind of an easy, easy fix to, to do that. Here we go, we've got these synth parts here as well. Let's um, rather just use uh, the mixer and do some volume automation on these guys. It's more than one way to kind of approach this. I've got that kind of flangey sort of noise hit and the crashes and stuff, but um, I'm going to add in um, a kick underneath, like a boomy kick. Uh, that could be quite a good way of adding emphasis. So just create a new track here and come into my library with my drums, find my drum samples, uh, kicks, and grab the main kick I've got here, rendered as audio, and just chuck a massive reverb onto that. Um, let's go for a large one, something like this. Probably want to balance the wet dry 50 50 or something like that. Just make it really big. Now that actually is a bit um, bright. I actually want to make it sound a bit sort of more um, uh, sort of duller than that. So I'm actually going to EQ before 
um, we hit that uh, massive reverb just to kind of remove the brightness of it. So I'm going to chuck this in beforehand and do a low pass filter. Something like that, perhaps. Going to bring this down a bit more, actually. Maybe turn up the resonance. There we go. There's also another layer in there. Maybe it's this drone. Uh, is it that one? Uh, yeah, so what I might do, if you've got lots of, lots of kind of crazy automation like this, sometimes it's easy just to group things and um, just apply volume change on the group above it. So you can kind of keep all this stuff preserved. Let's bring this in over the full 32. That's uh, this one as well. So there's quite a few different layers here um, that I need to kind of um, manage as well. So we've actually got uh, our filter. Oh, I don't think I drew it in. Maybe that's what it was. Anyway, like I said, trying to work quite quickly just to get a vibe going. There we go. That's better. So let's turn our attention back to our lead. Another kick boom here. So we've kind of introduced the main idea for the lead now. I think we need to introduce some other elements of the drop and specifically the kick to kind of get things going. So in the interest of time and to, I, kind, I guess, kind of demonstrate the workflow as well, I'm going to come into my library. I've got my drum samples here. I've also got some drum parts. And here I have a kick roll. So I can bring in this kick roll channel. And here's one that I made earlier. I have my kick roll. I think it also maybe be good to have a bit of the sub in at this point as well um, but whether or not I want it to match the lead and kind of copy this or just sort of sit there I'm not too sure I'm gonna I might just start with the kind of hummy harmonic layer um, so rather than the full uh, sub let's see how that sounds A good thing perhaps to also do would be to create a variation on this lead so that it doesn't get too boring. And what I have in mind is to maybe take this, I'm just going to duplicate this again actually one more time if I'm going to be applying lots of effects perhaps on this one and maybe just look to create like a loop, maybe something like that. Okay, uh, I'm just going to kind of make a faster section like that, just consolidate that, and then maybe look to pitch everything up. That could sound good. Kind of just build the anticipation into the drop. So it takes a little while to finesse these things, and you need to kind of get a feel for the content that's uh, kind of working for you and what's not. Um, but I'm not going to spend too long on that, other than to maybe look at um let's just remind ourselves what processing we've got on here so we've got an auto filter i'm going to add another one and this time i'm going to take a low cut and bring the low cut up I kind of filter it out so that when it comes back in it has a bit more energy again <laughs> and so i'm going to chop this here and actually make this twice as fast in this section again. 
Oops, just undo that. Join these together and just check the pitch bend again now. Just make sure that goes all the way up. Now, a common problem when you're doing this is that if everything's already like kind of loud because you've based it off the main drop section, there's going to be no kind of contrast between this bit and this bit. Uh, and that can be a bit of a problem. So one way to handle that, um, apart from like using filters to bring stuff in and, and out, um, is to actually just do a little bit of volume automation on the master bus here. So quite often what I like to do is just to manually draw in a bit of a, a dip in volume, maybe just like a dB or two, so that when it kind of kicks back in, you really hear the impact of it a bit more. And it might even need a bit more than that, but that can work quite well as well. So let's just uh, grab this section, make that a bit quieter. Now, as we don't have much going on here, I might just bring it down gradually so you don't really notice when you're listening to it. There was a sound there that ended a bit abruptly. Uh, I think it was this crash symbol here, was it perhaps? Might just need to drag that out a bit longer if it has a tail, which it might not. This might have already been rendered like that. Um, let's just grab another layer here and see what other parts we've got. So I've got this crash delay, which I can bring in, which is another layer from the library I made before. Let's hear what that sounds like. So something like that might be a bit better, actually. Maybe copy one over here as well. Uh, we've got some hi-hats here as well. I might just bring these in, some different patterns. It might make sense to start adding in a hi-hat at some point, maybe here. Over the drums, that works quite well. Um, I can't remember what some of these sound like. What else have we got here? We've got these airy snares. What was that? Uh, claps. I'm just going to chuck a load of stuff in. Um, I think these, because they're running through the other group and not kind of, uh, let's put this out of here because these have the hi-hat processing on them. Let's try that again. There we go. So just some extra kind of percussive layers, um, snare fills, let's see what these are. And we've got some toms here as well. So yeah, just, just a reminder that these are all kind of elements that we made um, right at the beginning, or I made right at the beginning, where, um, you know, it's all, again, based from a sample. This is a resampling of um, a tom that we made. Um, where are we here? Drums, drum samples. Um, percussion, here we go, these these guys. So yeah, and so kind of adding in content like this and kind of just chucking a load of stuff in and then working with it can be quite a good way of quickly working. So I guess I've been doing this for 10 or 15 minutes now and I should have something now approximating uh, the build up into the drop. Uh, let's just have a listen to how it sounds. Still some issue down here to fix.
So it's by no means perfect, but I've now got a rough idea of where this is going. And I, I'm, I think basically the main problem is these leads here don't really kind of work that well for me. It sounds a bit kind of disjointed. Um, I'd like to kind of go in and maybe add the full sub at this point here, which could be a bit fiddly uh, as we've seen before, but would actually kind of really help give it a bit more weight kind of coming into the drop. But generally as a workflow, you can see it's quite quick way of building ideas and helping you to kind of finish tracks more quickly rather than trying to do everything from the ground up. Um, and again, trying to sort of spend time designing sounds at this point if we can just come to the library, grab stuff that we've already got, it can help us get a feel for how the track's gonna work a lot more quickly. Okay, so I've just spent a little bit of time finessing things and I've got the build up and the drop pretty much how I want them. So let's take a listen to how the track sounds now. So that's it for part three, where we've taken all the elements we designed in parts one and two, starting of course with our basic pure sine wave, and then using these to build up the idea for the track, looking at programming and engineering the bass and the leads, composing and arranging the track itself, then processing the master and group buses, and getting the track to a suitable loudness level. And all of this using nothing but our humble sine wave, Ableton Live, and some free plugins. So if you are thinking about giving this a go, I'd say that for me personally, I've learned a huge amount from this slightly unusual approach to making music, and I'd encourage anyone to give it a go and see how you get on. It really forces you to think about how to manipulate sound at a fundamental level, solve problems, get to know the power of the plugins that you already own, and ones that are freely available. And you can use this workflow for really easily building up a big library of really clean sounds and parts that you can use time and time again to develop your own sonic identity and really speed up your entire workflow. So if you've enjoyed this series, please do like and subscribe to the DBS Institute YouTube channel. And if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer those. And thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon.